limiting the the body of evidence is the only way you can advance an argument that Joseph wasn't a polygamist. Because when you get all the documents out there, uh, any, I think, objective person is going to conclude, well, of course he did it. The evidence is really strong and really clear. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Saints Unscripted. We are back once again with our friend Brian Hales. Brian, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be back. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, and to everybody at home, I just have to say this. If it looks like I'm not looking at my camera, it's because Brian's in a different, he's behind my camera. So I am paying attention, I promise. You sure about that? Um, so Brian, today we want to talk about, uh, we're talking about polygamy once more. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting topic. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of members are tempted to believe and it's this idea that has been floating around that maybe joseph smith never actually practiced polygamy at all can you believe that so i guess my question is maybe you can help us flesh out what this argument is a little bit and then give your perspective on whether or not joseph did in fact practice polygamy. You can help us weigh the evidence a little bit. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to come on Saints Unscripted and address this because um, I, I wouldn't have predicted this based upon the amount of evidence, but we really do find uh, a lot of members and the numbers seem to be crescendoing, I, I, you know, rather than people getting knowledge and this kind of floating away like so many fads in, in, in associated with the restoration sometimes do. And I think what what I would like to do, David, if it's okay, is is use some slides uh, and and illustrate some of the problems. Now, I'm going to group together uh, these individuals and call them polygamy deniers. Now, I want to define what that means. It's not just people who say Joseph didn't do it, because because there are in the church some who believe that, and that's been the the party line of the reorganized church. Uh, for over a hundred years, they said Joseph didn't do it. Joseph Smith III, that was one of his his uh, pillar claims, pushing back against the Utah church. And uh, it wasn't until the 1980s and 90s that they actually changed and acknowledged that Joseph had done it. So that's oh, not an old claim. I didn't know that they changed their position on that. Yeah, they have. Um, okay. And and actually, their their church historian wrote a biography, not a biography, a histor history of their church and bringing it up to date. And he actually referred to Joseph practicing polygamy as ministerial abuse. He did it, but he shouldn't have. And, and actually, the polygamy deniers is going to, when I refer to them, include individuals who believe that. Uh, and they are within the church. They will believe that Joseph did it, but he shouldn't have. Hmm. He wasn't inspired. There was no angel that commanded it. Section 132 is a mistake. It was Joseph's voice, not God's. So when I refer to, to polygamy deniers, I'm talking about both groups, those who think he didn't do it or those who think he he did but shouldn't have. Gotcha. And and there, there are quite a number of voices. I'll, I'll mention a few names once. Um, it's not I don't I'm not here to have a fight with them. They can believe what they want. But when they start teaching things that I think are inaccurate, I you know, I feel obligated to to warn Latter-day Saints uh, of what their historical record, I think, supports much more. You the man! Okay, David, I appreciate the opportunity to maybe share my screen and, and also share some slides that I think will illustrate some of the problems with the perspective of the polygamy deniers. I think that can be accomplished most easily by just by using uh, a, a visual uh, assistant. And before we go into that, I want to just mention that I will be using a few slides, not many, from one of two videos that I've made. One is uh, The Truth Shall Make Us Free, a response to Rob Fotheringham, Whitney Horning, and Denver Snuffer. Um, and another one, an earlier video I did regarding Denver Snuffer's claims. And these can be accessed on my Facebook page or on my YouTube page, or just Google me with the title and it should come up as, as a link. But what I'd like to talk about are the techniques of the polygamy deniers. And again, I'm not saying that is, is a pejorative term, but just to understand who we're talking about, most of them use the techniques of amateur historians. 
They, they seem to choose their conclusions, and then they search the historical record for supportive documents. And then they will often take things out of context. They proof text, that's the term that's used, and, and make just a single sentence say far more than it meant when it was left in context. And we'll use some examples, we'll show you this. Now, a trained historian will search all of the historical documents using transparency, they will use critical source analysis. And what I mean by that is they look at each source, who said it, when did they say it, what were their biases, and they just analyze it to try to understand you know, its level of credibility, its level of reliability. And then they will choose their conclusions based upon all of these evidences and the analysis of the sources. And that doesn't mean they're all going to agree. There's almost always disagreements. There's, there's contradictory evidences. There's ambiguities. There's lack of evidence. There's all kinds of problems. But when you get everything transparently in front of you, you can usually come up with the best historical reconstruction. And so we'll talk about these. Let me just say, I am an amateur historian. Um, I was matriculated in a master's program for a part of a course until my wife was diagnosed with cancer and I withdrew. But so I've had a peek into academia and what this means. But throughout the last three decades, as I'm doing my study, I've tried to adopt all of the techniques of a trained historian. Now, when we look, I want to give four examples. This is the first one, that the amateur historians will often make this observation, that Joseph Smith's journal for October 5th, 1843, when it was transcribed into the history of the church, was changed. Mm. Okay, the original journal entry, it says, I walked, this is Joseph Smith, walked up and down the street, street with scribe and gave instructions to try those who were preaching, teaching the doctrine of a plurality of wives, on this law, Joseph forbids it, and the practice thereof. No man shall have but one wife. Now, if we go to the history of the church, it's volume 6, page 46, we find that this has been expanded, and it reads in the history of the church, which was published after Joseph's death and compiled after his death by during the tenure of Brigham Young. It reads, walked up and down the street with my scribe, gave instructions to those persons who were preaching, teaching, or practicing the doctrine of a plurality of wives, for according to the law, I hold the keys of this power in the last days, for there is never but one on earth at a time on whom the power and its keys are conferred. And I have constantly said, no man shall have but one wife at a time, unless the Lord directs otherwise. Now, mm -hmm. the amateur historian will come in and say, there have been a lot of of additional words that have been added here. Mm -hmm. They may say these were added by Brigham Young to try to change Joseph Smith's teachings. This is evidence that polygamy began with Brigham Young. Okay. They will also do a second thing. They will take these seven words, no man shall have but one wife, and say, here's Joseph's policy. We don't need to look any further. If anybody says Joseph was a polygamist or he advocated polygamy, he's contradicting Joseph Smith's policy, which is plainly stated here. And the third thing that the amateur historian does is they ignore the words on this law, Joseph forbids it, which is part of the 1843 declaration. Those three, the amateur historian, are problematic because first, let's look at the word law, on this law. Um, what law is Joseph Smith speaking about in his journal entry. He says, on this law, Joseph forbids it. And of course, the scribe is here changing from first person to third person, which doesn't really help our understanding any. But apparently there is a law that deals with the plurality of wives. And on this law, Joseph is, is forbidding it. It's not a law from the state of Illinois because they condemned plural marriage, at least spiritual marriage, if they were consummated. So it must be some other law. Is there another law? Well, in fact, there is another law. And um, there, there you can see it highlighted in, in Joseph Smith's uh, July 12, 1843 revelation, which is now section 132. He asks a question about wives and concubines. So he's asking about a plurality of wives, and God is going to answer him but he's going to answer him with the law of eternal marriage. It's the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And it has to do with eternal marriage, not plural marriage specifically. And how do we know that it has to do with eternal marriage, including eternal monogamous marriage? Well, we go to verse 19. It says that if 
a man marries a wife. See, section 132 doesn't mention polygamy after the first verse until about 30 verses later. So God is answering a question about polygamy by, by talking about eternal marriage, and it's monogamous marriage. He says, if a man marries a wife, which is monogamy, which is my law, here's the law again, the marriage shall be a full force when they are out of the world, if they use proper authority and live worthily. And we learn about those two parts of the law in verse 7. We learn that there is one man who is anointed. And it says here, I have appointed unto my servant Joseph to hold this power in the last days. And there never is but one on earth at a time on whom the power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred. So Joseph Smith holds the power to perform an eternal marriage. And he must authorize every marriage. How do we know this? Well, verse 18 tells us that if a man marry a wife and make a covenant with her for time and all eternity, if that covenant is not through him, whom I have anointed and appointed unto this power, then it is not valid, neither of force when they are out of the world. And so we find here that even a sincere couple, if, if they had personal revelation that they should practice polygamy, that if they didn't have the authority of the one man, then it is not valid. In other words, personal revelation doesn't get us there. And this is kind of a problem for the Mormon fundamentalist polygamists today who claim authority through Lauren Woolley or Eldon Kingston or uh, Dayer LeBaron or something like this. They, if you trace the lines of authority, it, it doesn't get us back to the one man. The one man is Russell M. Nelson today, and he's not allowing polygamy. And personal revelation and sincerity can't conjure up a valid polygamy. But that's, that's a sidebar discussion. The point is that we have here uh, an explanation why Joseph Smith would say that he has the keys and that on this power, he was preventing anybody from being a polygamist at that particular time. So if we compare the expanded version of history of the church to the revelation, this the, uh, the expanded version isn't Brigham Young changing Joseph Smith's meaning. This is Joseph Smith being expanded by Joseph Smith. We see the exact same words. The expansion is, I hold the keys of power in these last days. The revelation says, I have appointed my servant Joseph to hold this power in these last days. It is verbatim. So is the next part of the sentence. And, and, and so what we find is if we use amateur historian techniques, we come away deceived. But if we can expand and be transparent and understand what actually is happening, we will find that when Joseph Smith gave his scribe this information and then the scribe was putting it into the history of the church he's simply using joseph's words to help the audience understand what joseph was trying to teach and and, and when it comes to doctrine and covenants 132 um i've heard some arguments about that section specifically that that uh it might be that section 132 may not be joseph smith's wording precisely is that are you familiar with that argument well guess what that happens to be the next thing i want to talk about and there are people that will say that we don't have the original and they're true we do not have the original copy of the revelation and they will say since we don't have the original and they will also say there is no contemporaneous evidence that there was a revelation and that is simply false hmm. and and joseph smith's journal the same one that we were quoting from for July 12th says, received a revelation in the office in presence of Hiram Smith and William Clayton. So he says, I received a revelation today. And it's interesting, it was in the presence of Hiram Smith, because later accounts describe how Hiram told Joseph, why don't you dictate a revelation? I'll take it to Emma and, and try to smooth over some problems with Emma at that time. But also, William Clayton is listed as being present. Well, let's go to William Clayton's journal. William Clayton kept an, a, a very good journal. It's one of the most valuable things we have for this period. He said, this AM, I wrote a revelation consisting of 10 pages on the order of the priesthood, showing the designs of Moses, Abraham, and David and Solomon having many wives and concubines. So here we have contemporaneous evidence. Joseph gave a revelation that talks about polygamy. So anybody who says there's no contemporaneous evidence, they simply are uninformed or they are deceiving. And, and it, it's a very common claim, and that's why I'm being so kind of blunt about this. But what happened to it? Well, there's several different accounts. Did Emma burn it, or did Joseph burn it under Emma's direction? Joseph knew there had been a copy made. 
Um, it was destroyed. Everybody agrees on that. And you can go to my books in volume two. I go through, I've got several different accounts of what happened from different sources. Some are more credible than others, but it clearly was destroyed. But what had happened? Well, um, Joseph Kingsbury later said, Newell K. Whitney handed me the revelation and asked me to make a, a copy of it. I did so. And William Clayton, who wrote the original, said the copy made by Joseph C. Kingsbury is a true and correct copy of the original in every respect. And, and here it is. This is a copy of Joseph C. Kingsbury's copy of the Revelation. Now, it's going kind of fast, but you can get this. You can download this from the Church History uh, Library website, um, or, or maybe it's the Joseph Smith Papers website. But notice a couple of things that, that they verified the handwriting of Joseph C. Kingsbury. They've dated the paper, goes back to the Nauvoo era. You can see there are no edits. And we have... The person who wrote it and the person who wrote the original are telling us this is a genuine copy of the revelation from Joseph Smith. This is this is remarkable provenance. What that means is that that people say that it, that that we don't know for sure if we have a good copy. That that's a false statement based on some really good declarations from the people who were involved. So basically, just, basically to 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 believe. Um, based on these arguments that we've been looking at so far to believe that Joseph Smith wasn't practicing polygamy, you've got to go fairly deep down the conspiracy rabbit hole and believe that William Clayton and Joseph Kingsbury and Brigham Young and a whole host of other people are all conspiring against Joseph. Exactly. It, it's, it's something that, see, the amateur historian just grabs the evidence, evidences that they like and they ignore everything else. And then they present that to their often gullible listeners. Hmm. And the listeners don't go out and, and try to contextualize it. They don't try to expand the research. They just believe the limited documents that are presented. And here, if we'll just look with transparency, and I'm a guy who's who's tried to see every document dealing with Joseph Smith and plural marriage, and more recently, uh, the origin of the Book of Mormon. I love transparency. Bring on transparency. Bring on all of the historical documents, because as I read them, I always find space for faith and belief in Joseph Smith. It's only when we get these documents filtered through a second party who is either an amateur historian or an anti-Mormon or, or something that we get a message that I think is inconsistent with the original documents, but also a message that destroys faith. In review, if we look at Section 132, it was dictated on July 12th. On the 13th, a copy is made. On August 12th, a month later, it's read to the Nauvoo High Council. Hiram brings it out and just reads it. A pretty amazing occurrence. Willard Richards makes a copy. Horace Whitney makes a copy. His, his uh, father, Newell K. Whitney, turns it over to Brigham Young, who keeps it and publishes it in 1852. This is a very strong provenance. Um, mm -hmm. And people who say that we don't understand what happened to it and stuff, they're simply not looking at the evidence. They're, they're choosing to believe something that I think is, is faulty. And also... There are all of these individuals left a record that they read the, the section that I mean, the, the copies that were there were circulated to some degree. And uh, William Law said he took it home and read it to his wife and, and they were very surprised about it. Um, here are six people who said it was read to the high council that corroborate that. And one of them is Leonard Sobey, and he later left the church. He left the reorganized church. Here, he's outside of the restoration completely, but people went up to him. Now, this is late. It's 1886. But he says, yes, this is the revelation. It was read to the high council. So we really have quite a lot of evidence showing us that there was a revelation. It came from Joseph Smith. It talks about his polygamy. It's contemporaneous. Um, not only are the journal entries, but the very existence of this copy by Kingsbury, all contemporaneous evidence of Joseph Smith's involvement, teaching, and, and practice of plural marriage. And so I hope I hope we can just kill this this dialogue that that there is no contemporaneous evidence. There absolutely is. I want to give a second example. This comes from a video. I won't name who it, it was, but it comes at minute fifty nine. Uh, but she is trying to advance the uh, the polygamy deniers agenda, and she quotes this, and this is a, a friend allegedly of Phoebe Woodworth Woodruff. She says, "How is it, Sister Woodruff, that you have changed your your views so suddenly about polygamy? I thought you hated and loathed the institution." Allegedly, Phoebe Woodruff 
whose husband was president of the Quorum of the Twelve in 1882, said, I have not changed. I loathe the unclean thing with all the strength of my nature, but sister, I have suffered all a woman can endure. I am old and helpless, and I would rather stand up anywhere and say anything commanded of me than to be turned out of my home in my old age, which I should be most assuredly if I refuse to obey counsel. So here this quote is basically saying that the women who are practicing polygamy are doing it so they can keep a, a roof over their heads and they're happy to lie about it if that's what they have to do. That's the message of this quotation. What are our polygamy denier friend who's using this quote, and again, I, I, I copy and pasted this right from her video, but they don't tell us this is a quote from the anti-polygamy standard. Hmm. We don't know who the friend is. And we don't have any corroboration that Phoebe actually said it. She didn't come out later and, and say, yeah, this is what I said. In fact, and, and the professional historian, the trained historian is going to say, well, do we have anything else from Phoebe around this period of 1882 that has her talking about polygamy? And yes, we do. In 1880, just two years before, she wrote with her own hand, her autobiographical sketch. And here she said, when the principles of polygamy was first taught, I thought it was the most wicked thing I ever heard of. Consequently, I supposed it to the best of my ability until I became sick and wretched. As soon, however, I became convinced that it originated as a revelation from God through Joseph. And knowing him to be a prophet, I wrestled with my heavenly father in fervent prayers to be guided aright at that all important moment of my life. The answer came. Peace was given to my mind. I knew it was the will of God. So here we have her not only declaring that she believed in it, but why she did. And, and I've, I've cut this short. You could read her, her, her full autobiographical sketch. She very much believed in it. And, and this, this quotation um, that we're getting from the anti-polygamy standard is highly dubious. But yeah. again, the amateur historian, the agenda-driven you know, propagandist is going to isolate these things and present a line of evidence, and only that line of evidence that won't give us truth. It won't give us accurate historical reconstructions. Now, the um, the fourth example I want to give comes from Denver Snuffer, and he he in a in an, a talk said if Joseph Smith engaged in polygamy, it was a secret, private, dishonest, culpable practice of the plural wife thing, or a private, secret, licentious, adulterous practice. And what we find here is that he he wants he's a reductionist. And Rob Fotheringham does the same thing in his videos. He wants us to he, reduce the question of polygamy to, do you believe in Brigham or do you believe Emma? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, assuming Emma always denied it, which she didn't based on a number of very reliable evidences. But if you reduce it to these simple things, do if Joseph did it, then he was a liar and an adulterer. If Do you believe Brigham do you, or do you believe Emma? I mean, we, we create out of artificial dichotomies that don't begin to help us understand what really happened. And, and I think and, that it, along that same vein, we we play on people's emotions uh, and faith. And we say, you know, am I going to believe Brigham Young or Joseph Smith? And and everybody wants to, you know, root for for the prophet, of course. And uh, it, 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 yeah, it's re it's reductionist. It's making things a little too simple and, and ignoring some of the nuances here. Very good uh, summary. They. The uh, this reductionist mentality is is embraced over and over by people, and it's just not useful. Why are we afraid of transparency? Why do we have to reduce things down to their evidences when transparency should support their conclusion if it's if it's accurate, if it's correct? Hmm. And and here are just some resources. I I a few years ago published an article in the Journal of Mormon History where I went through and tried to find every alleged a reference from Joseph Smith where he allegedly lied. Mm. And I even expanded it because there's not very many to Emma and Hiram. And I, Joseph wasn't always forthright with the government who would put him in jail if they knew all the details. That's true. But him, as far as him being a bald-faced liar or deceiving, the evidence just is not there. I, I, I strongly argue. I frankly am a little more concerned about things that, that Hiram said. Mm. But what we're left with is we have a whole list of people who left records, statements describing Joseph Smith's involvement with plural marriage. Again, transparency requires us to look at all of these accounts. And we may say, well, some of them are old. Some of them are so biased. We don't want to believe them, but all of them? Are we going to dismiss them all? Like Denver Snuffer says, well, we're not going to believe anything after Joseph's death. That's that's ridiculous. I mean, that is that is so amateurish in its approach to, to history. 
that you would never do that. What are we afraid of in transparency? So I strongly encourage transparency. I have an article in The Interpreter where I summarize the arguments. Here is the website you mentioned earlier, it's Mormon Polygamy Documents. There's about 20 gigabytes of data here. Uh, 15 of those gigabytes deal with Joseph Smith's polygamy. There's about five that deal with fundamentalist topics. But if you go to my website, it's josephsmithspolygamy.org. Uh, you will find all kinds of essays and audio there. You can also download a handout I made responding to this very uh, thing at, where I show, among other things, that Joseph did deny spiritual wifery. He denied freelance polygamy. He denied a community of wives. He never denied celestial plural marriage. Mm. And that was what was being practiced secretly under his direction. Um, I also have my three volumes. It's over 1,500 pages. There's the gospel topic essay. There's Saints, which you can listen to and download for free. If you if you listen to the Saints Volume 1, you will get all the controversies surrounding Joseph Smith's polygamy. They haven't pulled any punches. It's all right there. They explain it, how I believe it happened and why it did. Um, those who, who say Joseph was driven by libido or, or, or these other things, I just don't think that's the correct interpretation of what happened. Uh, the people around Joseph Smith wouldn't have put up with a version of Joseph Smith at advanced by Fawn Brody and, and these other antagonists today. They were just as skeptical as you and I, and God was there sustaining this as a practice, even though I, I don't like the practice personally. And then lastly, the Joseph Smith Papers Project um, has, has really uncovered every stone. I don't think we're going to have any new data on polygamy coming out, so it's up to us to just look at what's there. Um, I mean, we may get a new document, but it would have to come, I think, from a private source that is currently unknown to anyone. And that could happen, but I don't think it's going to. So I, I, one of the takeaways that I'm, I'm getting from this is um, there's a reason why Joseph Smith papers, the, the official church, uh, and all of these real historians um, are claiming that Joseph Smith actually practiced polygamy. Like it's, there's, there's a reason for that. There's evidence behind it. And I think that it's important to recognize like the actual scholarship versus what some amateur historians are saying. And that's not to say that all amateur historians are wrong about everything they ever say. I'm an amateur historian myself, uh, meaning I don't I don't have a degree in, in this stuff. Um, but I think it's important to recognize the, the scholarship that is out there. Again, it comes back to transparency. We should be afraid of it, and and the you know limiting the the body of evidence is the only way you can advance an argument that Joseph wasn't a polygamist. Because when you get all the documents out there, uh, any I think objective person is going to conclude, well, of course he did it. The evidence is really strong and really clear. Yeah. But you know, people choose to believe what they want to believe, and and they're and entitled think, to do that. So. I think that's a big part of it because. I think a little part of everybody wants to believe that Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy and we can just kind of shrug this whole thing away. That didn't happen. So um, I did have a couple of questions for you. Great. Um, you had mentioned that Emma Smith never actually denied uh, that her husband Joseph had practiced polygamy. And I feel like that is a big sticking point for for uh, polygamy deniers because we have this interview, this this record of Joseph Smith III, Emma's son, interviewing his mother, Emma, and asking her straight out, you know, did, did Joseph have multiple wives? And she says, no. That's, of course, a summary, uh, a paraphrasing of the interview. But uh, I'm curious what uh, what you've uncovered regarding Emma. Um, regarding her so-called denials, I, I don't believe Joseph Smith III. Um, that whole interview uh, was was written down, at, at published well after Emma ha or had died. Emma wasn't there to respond to it. And I've seen his Joseph Smith III's notes for those those interviews, and we think there were more than one. And there's nothing written down. There's there's a number of things written down about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, which I really like what she said or allegedly said about the Book of Mormon. There's no notes about at least that we have currently, and there may have been and they've been lost, but nothing about what she actually said regarding polygamy. And I really have trouble with interviews that are come that come through Joseph Smith III. And, and the reason is we have a published interview by him when he came to Utah and talked to Melissa Lott. 
And Melissa Lott was a, a, a wife of Joseph Smith. She testified under oath that she had sexual relations with Joseph as his plural wife. She's one of the three that was deposed in the Temple Lot case. And so she she knew what was going on firsthand. And this is late that these things are, are being testified to, but he visits her and he publishes in the Saints Herald. This is the uh, reorganized church's uh, newspaper, the interview. And the interview talks about how he asks her if she was Joseph's wife in very deed or something like that. And she starts to cry and says, no, no, it was a spiritual thing and on and on. And then we have in several letters of Melissa Lott, her describing the same interview. And she says, I told Joseph, Joseph Smith III in no, um, no uncertain un terms, no uncertain terms. I was his wife in every way. And so she affirms that she told him that this was a full marriage. And we have him publishing something saying exactly the opposite. And and I believe Melissa, okay? Hmm. Uh, and and I, I believe Melissa because also we have letters from Joseph Smith III uh, writing to a missionary, E.C. Brand, in Salt Lake City, asking Brand to find the branches of the family tree to identify his dad, his father's plural wife. So he he knew. And there's another letter from, from Joseph Smith III and I talk about this in one of my videos to his his uncle, William, who is going to write a biography of Joseph, who is his brother. And William, and Joseph Smith III is telling William, you can forget certain things. You know, that would be good. And, and so I think Joseph Smith III absolutely knew, but he was dedicated. And I think he was a good man. I, he did a lot of good things. But he was dedicated to this narrative that his father wasn't a polygamist, even though he, he's trying to defend the family honor, even though Joseph he knew had been doing it. So that particular interview where Emma is allegedly said, no, no, I was his only wife. I think we're hearing Joseph Smith III and not Emma because we have from uh, McClellan, William McClellan, who he was an original member of the 12, who was excommunicated and left the church. He visited Emma in 1847, had a conversation with Emma. He said, I heard Joseph was a polygamist. And Emma said, well, you tell me what you heard and I'll tell you if it's true or not. And then William McClellan, a decades later, wrote a letter to Joseph Smith III saying, Joseph Smith III, you should stop telling people that your father wasn't a polygamist because here's the conversation I had with your mother. And he recounts several things that show very clearly that Joseph had been a, a polygamist, at least in, in Kirtland. So, and, and so we, we have evidence that Emma knew. Hmm. And, and, and there are several late accounts that Emma was was overseeing the temple ceremony in Nauvoo as the matron. At the same time, she's telling the women who are receiving the ordinances, your husbands are going to take plural wives. We need to stamp this out. And so and she, she's pushing back against something she's very much aware of. And she's very much aware that her husband is, is involved with it. So the, the evidence is pretty strong, I think, that Emma knew um, and that her denials, such as they are, are problematic. So the idea is that uh, that what Joseph Smith III reported that Emma had said wasn't likely what she actually said. I I don't think so. I we know that he was capable. And again, I hate I don't like to say bad things about Joseph Smith III because I really respect the guy. He did an amazing job leading that church for so long. But his willingness to misrepresent Melissa Lott, and we can show that very plainly. In fact, Todd Compton in his book shows the, the, the differences. And I've got other evidences showing that Melissa wrote several people talking about this, this uh, interview and, and how she told him, yes, I was his wife in very deep. I just, I can't believe Joseph Smith III and anything that he brings forth without somebody being there to check it. So, yeah. so was his interview with Emma um it, it wasn't published until after after emma's death right and, and eliza r snow after she read it she she wrote this you know she said if emma actually said those words she died with libel on her lips oh burn wow. eliza eliza r. snow she she's very uh eloquent sometimes yes and and uh, and there's just lots of evidence from other women who remember that she guarded the door for Joseph when he was spending time with his plural wives and 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 these kinds of accounts. So, so that leads me to another question. One of the other uh, uh, 
evidences that polygamy deniers bring up um, is that, well, if Joseph was practicing polygamy, where are all of the children? Shouldn't he have been having kids with all of these other wives? And as far as I'm aware, there's not uh, evidence that there were any other children besides those he had with Emma. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on that claim and that as an evidence for in support of polygamy deniers? Well, I think it's an important observation. And if you go to josephsmithpolygamy.org, and there's a, a link to a chart there um, where I've gone through and identified every alleged offspring of Joseph Smith. And the eight most likely have been disproven through DNA. Ugo Perigo, with his wonderful work, has shown that. So we don't know of any by DNA. But we do have several accounts, um, one from George A. Smith. It's secondhand. Uh, that one of Joseph Smith's plural wives delivered. Emma was the, the midwife. Um, we have uh, Mary Elizabeth Rollins relating how she knew of two or three of Joseph Smith's children by plural wives, but she said they were they were raised in other families and went by other names. And, and so to say there's no evidence of, of children to Joseph, that's simply a false statement. There is evidence. It's just not as good of evidence as we would like. If they did come up with some some evidence, it wouldn't surprise me. But with each generation, our ability to know becomes significantly less. So I, I doubt that's going to happen. Um, and, and people have looked, again, at the most likely candidates. But what we have is we have three women who said under oath in, in the Temple Lot uh, testimony that they had relations with Joseph as part of their... Uh, being a plural wife. These women wanted to have children with him. That would have been a really boon to them in their relationship. And and But at the same time, if we look how many years Joseph was practicing it very secretly, and then once Emma found out in 43, it was even more secretly because I think she was she was watching out and, and being uh, making it even more difficult. He wasn't spending a lot of time with these women. And, and yet uh, to, to say that that shows there was no sexual relations at all, to dismiss all of the evidence, and, and I list all of the evidence on my website. It's in a, an appendix E in volume two of my my uh, polygamy volumes. Um, to just dismiss that as as, as people lying about it, I, I, that's just not a, a credible. These are these are, are people who would not do that, I think. And and so if but if again if we are a reductionist, if we want to reduce it to one little fact and ignore the remaining facts and take it out of context, again, that argument goes forward, but it shouldn't go forward because it's it's not uh, complete. It's it's an incomplete observation. Moving on to another question, um, another uh, evidence that uh, polygamy deniers that I've seen uh, stick to is uh, in the Nauvoo era, people like John C. Bennett are participating in spiritual wifery and then joseph publicly denounces this practice uh, could you could you explain to us maybe the difference between plural marriage as joseph was practicing and this other practice that that uh john c bennett is participating in as i look at the history of the restoration i i see a chess match between god and satan joseph smith brings forth the book of mormon and within three years solomon spaulding manuscript pops up and the people who are promoting Solomon Spaulding is actually being the source of the Book of Mormon. But people have this manuscript, but they know there's no similarity. So they bury it and they keep the theory arrived. And for 50 years, it's it's the explanation for where the Book of Mormon came from. Everybody almost is quoting it. Then we go on and, and we have the uh, uh, Kirtland Temple spiritual manifestations, which are very remarkable. But immediately thereafter, we have the Kirtland Safety Society falling apart and people apostatizing, you know, just just within a year or two of all of these these great things with the temple. Um, we get into Nauvoo. Joseph is restoring his what I think is his Zenith teaching, which is eternal marriage. And suddenly John C. Bennett shows up with his spiritual wife. -free. I mean, there's just this move mm. back and forth. And if, if Bennett had shown up a year or two earlier or a year or two later, he wouldn't have had near the impact. But what, the, a couple of points that are, are, are important to point out, um, Bennett's spiritual wifery had nothing to do with, with wifery or marriage. Hmm. Um, his teaching was very simple. We can have sex if we don't tell anybody. That, that was the sum total. There was no ceremony. They could repeat it or they could not. There was no obligation. There was no marriage at all. 
Um, and again, early on, people wanted to say because he had been an assistant counselor to the first presidency, he must have been a polygamy insider. I wrote a very long article published in the Journal of Mormon History in 2015 or 16. Look at all the evidence here. Je Bennett was close enough to hear rumors. He was not a polygamy insider at all. And we can show this. I mean, the evidence is really compelling. I won't repeat it here. But the other important point is that Bennett left in the summer of 42. In the summer of 42, there were only three uh, polygamists in Nauvoo. Joseph, who had been sealed to several women. Most of them were time and eternity non-sexual sealings. And then Brigham may have had one wife and Heber Kimball had one wife. So see, Bennett is out of the picture before the Nauvoo polygamy really even gets going. Mm. And so the chronology doesn't line up. The theology, if you can call Bennett's spiritual wifery theological, doesn't line up. There's lots of dissimilarities. I summarize them all in this, unfortunately, very long article in the Journal of Mormon History, and you can Google it and, and if anybody's interested. So. so one other question that I have, and this is this is based on a lot of comments that we get Uh from our videos, we see a lot of people commenting, saying Joseph Smith didn't practice polygamy. He practiced plural marriage. And I'm not sure if that comment is basically looking at the, the semantics of the language uh, or what that might be commenting on. Um, is there a, just as far as terms go, should we be using plural marriage or is polygamy perfectly fine to use? Well, or, po or polygyn polygyny. Polygyny. Polygyny, yeah. how I say it. You know, if I can expand the answer to include the question, is polygamy a principle, a doctrine, a law, or a commandment? Um, and those all have ramifications for us. You know, if polygamy were an actual law of God, you would expect it in the Book of Mormon. You'd expect it, you know, to be today. Um, and I went through and did a study. You're, you're familiar with General Conference Corpus. It's a website where you can go back and search. It's, it's incredible. Um, and I searched to find out what the early brethren used to refer to plural marriage and polygamy. And they, the terms were used synonymously. I don't think there's any value in trying to divide them um, unless we put celestial in front of plural marriage. Celestial plural marriage, I see as a different entity than just polygamy and and because of authority and expectations, covenants and things. But just the words plural marriage and and polygamy, those are used synonymously. And, and early brethren referred to the practice of plural marriage using all of those terms. Hmm. Okay, commandment, law, principle. Doctrine. Um, doctrine, yeah, doctrine, principle. And, and, and so I don't think we can go back and try to determine, you know, is this an eternal law, except to say that it's not in the Book of Mormon, and and so you know obviously that tells us something, um, but the uh, the reality is, and John Taylor has a really nice quote: "God has told us about the law of eternal marriage. Associated with it is the principle of plural marriage." And to me, that's the best language. Okay, polygamy is not a covenant; it's not an ordinance. Okay, it is not a law; it is a commandment that can be invoked or not invoked. It can be permitted, as as the quote said that we looked at. It's only when God permits, um, and it, but best it's a practice and a principle. And again, it can be invoked or not invoked according to God's laws. The key holder is Russell Nelson today. He's not allowing polygamy. I don't think polygamy will return, uh, except it, it may be permitted during the millennium. Um, I think that every worthy person will be able to, to choose the type of marriage dynamic and the, the, the spouse they are in. There will be ceilings vicariously. There will be loosenings vicariously mm -hmm. to get everybody who's worthy. And that's the important thing. But following a false prophet today, which the fundamentalist polygamists are doing, is not going to bring rewards. So that's not the pathway that we would advocate. I love the thought that, that you know, there's room for grace and nobody, uh, according to kind of our, our faith and our belief, Nobody's going to be stuck in a relationship that they don't want to be in. Absolutely. The key is be worthy. Follow yeah. the living prophet. Stay in the covenant path. Do you have any final thoughts for us before we close? Um, you know, the, the process of researching Joseph Smith's polygamy for many years uh, has led me to believe one thing about Joseph. He wasn't perfect, but he was always worthy. And those who come out with the denial that he he was authorized or things. I, I don't believe this. I think they're wrong. Uh, Joseph 
was very much worthy as he wasn't perfect though okay he had he had his weaknesses he wouldn't have wanted us to think of him as being perfect um but but please don't think that whatever the critics are saying would have made him unworthy to be a prophet he he was a prophet in 1829 when he dictated the book of mormon he was a prophet when he died that that would be my my uh, conviction to share I always think of, um, oh man, a quote, I've used it in, in one or two of my videos, but uh, I think it was Lyman something or other. And he said, uh, you know, paraphrasing, of course, we practiced the principle of plural marriage to the best of our ability and made many crooked paths in our ignorance. And I think that's that's pretty true. Everyone watching, if you've got questions for Brian, can they leave them in the comments section? Is that okay, Brian? Yes, please do. But if I don't respond or if something, write me at josephsmithspolygamy at gmail.com. Joseph Smith's with an S, polygamy, but all one word at gmail.com. I'll, I'll get back with you in a day or two. Perfect. Thank you, Brian, so much. Everyone watching, thank you for being with us today. Have a great day.